I just don't know what went wrong. Hello there, everypony, and welcome to episode 19 of the Brony Book Club. I am, of course, your host, Roy, and we have on the co-host, as always, Sam. Hi. Again. And we have on our special guest this week, Palio Prince. Hey! He is on for his thick choices, because this week is Background Pony Week. Yay! Background Pony! They need their love, too. Yeah. I swear, if it's, here's just a notification for this entire, like, this goes to the comments, and this goes to you two. No one make Applejack jokes, okay? <laughs> oh, gosh. Can we just swear off, though? Uh, Please. Maybe she'll get an okay. episode someday. <laughs> yeah. But she got two! Yeah, kind and of. Rarity didn't get any this season. Hey, I'm kind of surprised I'm the jokes so... haven't gone to her now. She was kind of Applejack's walk-on girlfriend this season. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was... I, I think Brenton made the joke, or someone did, where it was... Uh, it doesn't matter. I don't feel bad as a Rarity fan that she didn't get any episodes because she got so many amazing ones in season two yeah. that she doesn't really need any in season this three. This is true. Yeah. And she, it's, it's her generosity. She gave up her episodes to others so they <laughs> might have. <laughs> Though I still don't know why there were two Spike episodes. Like, I like Spike, but geez. Yeah. Maybe the second okay. one was making up for the first one? You know what? That <laughs> could have been. All righty. So, let's start off by interviewing our guest this week, Palio. Uh, i got some questions for you. Shoot. All right. So, what is your favorite tag? What is the tag you'll see on a fic and be like, I should probably read that? I like Slice of Life because a lot of people can do adventure and it's ponies throwing with the monsters. Sad is good, but it gets, I think, a little bit vague. I really wish there was a drama tag, which is mm. stuff happens instead of just horrible stuff happens and everybody dies. But <laughs> I find it much more interesting to have a fic in which Luna and Celestia are dealing with day-to-day -day stuff in Canterlot Castle than Luna and Celestia have to save the world. I like to see what some of these characters do in their day-to-day. -day. And there's plenty of drama that you can do in comedy with that. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, um, a lot of people immediately associate slice of life with comedy, which there are, a, we have a lot, and especially in this uh, fandom, we have a lot of good slice of life comedy. Oh, yeah. I mean, from the series we're based off of, there are a lot of good slice of life comedy episodes. Mm -hmm. That's the background. Yeah. But um, I like, I find more and more what slice of life drama fit are really good. Like, you're right, I think drama should be attacked, because just lumping drama in with tragedy is completely not right. I, like, even even using literary, or, or rather, um, theater terms, it's completely untrue. Oh, well, heck, in theater terms, it's more untrue. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think, is it Fimfic or EQD that now has tragedy and sad as two tags? Because there's... Uh, a... it's FIM Fiction, I believe. Yeah, FIM Fiction does, I know which is really good because I constantly get te uh, comments on my stories that, oh, it's sad, I just might read this, because when they see sad, they expect Fluttershy dies of cancer. Not, <laughs> I will try to give you the feels, but you will have happy ending in the end, you know. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. All right, so that kind of leads to the next question. What kind of tags do you not like? What, what kind of tags do you see, and it's going to take a lot of convincing to actually get you to read the story. I have a problem with Grimdark in that it is also very vague. Now, seeing it as someone who has read all and loved Fallout Equestria. Yeah. Me too. My right. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's great stuff. Love it. My problem is then, uh, and let me quickly throw out a plug. Anyone who has read Fallout Equestria and love it, also read Pink Eyes, because that's equally good. Is it? Oh, yeah. But very um, dark and darkly humorous at the same time. Uh, you'd never think you'd root for a zombie toddler, but you will. <laughs> but the problem with Grimdark is that it's, once again, a huge blanket, and everything gets painted with the cupcakes brush. Like, when I was working with a collaboration on one of my Doctor Who's fix, because it's a Doctor Who's fic, I write like a Doctor Who's episode, there are monsters and ponies die. They say, well, since a pony dies, and, you know, it's not like I focus on organs spilling out or anything... Yeah. They, I go with the Alfred Hitchcock scream of horror. It's scarier for your imagination goes with it. They say, well, it has to be grimdark. And the moment I put grimdark, some people look and think, oh, it's Rainbow Factory. So <laughs> once again, grimdark is something that flips a switch of, oh, it must mean Dr. Hooves has to watch someone get dismembered. It's, <laughs> it's just when you try to make all of the literature that people want to write and put it within six categories, it gets very hard. 
And I've seen some Grimdark, which is just written because I want to write a story in which Rainbow Dash has horrible things happen to her. So that's a tricky oh. tag for me to read. I need to make sure that there's a good idea and there's a reason for stuff to happen. I don't want to go into a fic and have it be that... I don't remember which one it was, but it was, what if the U.S. government started capturing ponies and started dissecting them because they couldn't understand Ew. equestrian? Uh. Yeah, that actually came up a little bit last episode because we were talking about Fallout Equestria, and Roy definitely mentioned that he didn't think Grimdark belonged on it considering it's so different from something like Cupcakes. Like, I, I understand how the tag it's can not... mean both things, but it... They are two very, very different I, types. Of I'm, ra I'm rather more angry that it has to include those things. Like, when I hear Grimdark, the first image, obviously, is it, for me, I don't love it in Cupcakes. It's Warhammer 40K. Yes. Because that's a universe where the closest thing to the good guys are the humans. And they are horrible. <laughs> they are, like, such a dark shade of gray that they would be the villains in anything else. But they're the good guys because everything else is so horrible that you have to root for them. Exactly. Warhammer 40K that is, is made just like that. It was made to justify everything awful. Yeah. And and for Fallout Equestria, I think, for me, the Grimdark is justified maybe in just one way. Now, there's violence, and I don't mind violence, but I would put some kind of... It has a mature tag, but I, some kind of mature rating because rape comes up as a story yeah. thing, and yeah. that is triggery for people. And we live in America, where they'll buy an eight-year-old a video game if you rip out someone's spleen, but if a girl takes off her top, it's instantly M. <laughs> so with with a subject topic like that, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, um, we actually spent the entire last episode was all about Fall of Equestria, pretty much. Cool. So if I could add a little a little extra thing to talk about Fall of Equestria, like I mentioned last week. If you did not watch last week's episode, please go do so. I talked about, like, when it comes to Grimdark, I didn't find very Grimdark. Because, you know, reading, absorbing so much media as I do, when I start something, I attune myself to the morality of the series. Mm. And in that vein, I played a lot of Fallout 3, and Fallout Equestria pretty much is about the same morality as Fallout 3. The heroes range from a lightish gray to a mid-gray, while the villains are almost always a very dark gray, if not just a pure black. It's gray and gray, but it's more gray and black. Yeah. So, I'm used to it. And so I didn't, I wasn't shocked, I wasn't like, oh, Grimdark, because I'm like, no, this is that kind of series. I'm not going to be like, Grimdark is, I think it should be reserved for when you go into something, and then it turns that level. Like, if you're not prepared for it. Hmm. Yeah. That's what I think of Grimdark. I'll definitely grant you that. Fallout Equestria has a, a morality. You read it generally assuming after the first few chapters that the bad guys are going to be in some way punished even if the good guys suffer some losses. And yeah. it's harder to say that something's grimdark if you know that it's going to be one of those classic good versus evil stories instead of one of those every character stabbing each other in the back stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Indeed. Okay, so next question. Okay. How did you get the idea for choices? Well, I started writing School Days. And Lyra popped up in school days, first as a uh, teen where the reader has to read between the lines, but it's written in really big between the line letters that she's being bullied at the school because she's a lesbian. And then I had her pop back up later in the story, and it just popped in my head. I started hinting that she and Shirley had a relationship in college. And that started playing in my head. I started writing a flashback and wondering what brought these two characters together, what took these two characters apart, and why are they still friends afterwards? And I started thinking about writing that. And I had already written the three who's at that point. So I had my idea of Ditsy, and I thought, what if Shirley and Ditsy were roommates? I get to take the three favorite background ponies that I'm writing, or really the three favorite mares that I'm writing, because I don't write very much main six stuff, or I didn't back oh. then. And I get to tell and weave all of their stories together. I get to make it a prequel, and maybe if someone likes one story, they'll go to another. And unbeknownst to me, I think Choices is my highest rated story on Fimfic, meaning more yeah. people are going into the prequel before the actual stories, which makes me nervous, but apparently it's working. I, I love it. Um, I, I think I told you this over chat. I started, re after reading Choices and finding out about it, I started reading School Days, 
And sadly, I, I really want to finish it because I got like two chapters in. And I was enjoying it, but it was it was a little, it was slightly rocky. And like right behind it in my thing, in my queue, was a fic we've mentioned several times in the show in which Blue Blood becomes Batman. <laughs> so I was kind of distracted. I was like, well, I'm just going to skip to that. Yeah, Roy's a sucker I, for Blue Blood and Batman. That, that, that was his kryptonite right there. Hey! Blue Bud has so much good story writing potential. There's a yeah. great secret origin for his family in the Voltaire Celestia crossover fic. Uh, what is it called? The Best of All Possible Worlds. There's that brilliant Groundhog's Day fic that where Blue yeah. Bud is Bill Murray. He's got okay. a lot of stuff. And I don't mind you saying the first two chapters of School Days are rocky. It's the first thing I ever wrote, and I wrote out the first chapter in the middle of a really boring Star Wars the RPG session. I've been <laughs> meaning to go over school days with a fine-tooth comb and tear out the lavender unicorn syndrome and all that, but it's really hard for an author to go back and look his own child in the face. And apparently yeah. people really liked it, so I don't want to take the lightning in the bottle, unscrew the cap, and leave it off. But one of those days, I'm going to polish up the first few chapters. I, that would be great. I, would, I want to go do that now. Okay. Focus. Um, <laughs> yes, but... I would like to say that that Vic you mentioned, the best night ever, the uh, Groundhog's Day one. That is, has, I think, since very early on in the show, has been a regular mentioned favorite. Awesome. That uh, that Vic is made of 120 percent win, and I need to go back and read it because it's literally been like since the beginning of the show, like four or five months since I, since I last read it. So I need to go do that. That surprised me when, when I heard about people rereading my fanfics and rereading fanfics. I don't usually reread much literature, even the stuff I really like. So I, I need to start looking and thinking about what have I read so far off that I will have forgotten stuff. Then again, in the last four months, I've reread 37 Discworld novels, so I guess I do reread stuff. <laughs> I need to get it. Okay, we're probably going to talk about that later with another question. But I just like to say I love what I've read of Discworld but I need to read more. I've only read, like, one book. I can give you some suggestions. Stuff for, well, I want to do it chronologically, because I own The Color of Magic, and I love it, but I want to, I know it gets better, and I want to read its high points as well. Like, I know Hogfather is a great, uh, really great one. I know um, Guards Guard. Mm -hmm. so, uh, like, I know the names of a bunch of them, and I want to read them, but I want to do it chronologically, so I can't have any idea what's going on. Just remember, I, Pratchett finds his voice about Mort. That's when Discworld becomes definitively, this is not me mocking other fantasy. I found what makes this me. Yes. Mm. Good idea. Okay. So, anyway, next thing. What's your favorite thing about choices? What I like about my story choices is that I make all of these characters disagree with each other, break up, have problems at the end. And I didn't have to resort to any of the stupid sitcom thing where, oh, this person accidentally finds this and thinks something wrong. None of the things where this person gets the wrong note or overhears the wrong thing that all of the breakups and trouble happen from. I, I wanted actions that seemed loud and clear, not just, oh, if Cheerily had walked in the room ten seconds earlier, ten seconds later, everything would be fine, because I usually... <laughs> find that so contrived. I wanted to make sure that everything actually stemmed from the actions of the characters and their personality, and I actually had to go back and edit it for that. Um, on the Bronyville podcast, Chef Sandy gave me a criticism where he said that he thought there was a big leap in character development that didn't happen between Chapter 3 and Chapter 4, which is why I went back and added that middle chapter about a uh, heartwarming E for the characters because I, I wanted an extra like an extra chapter just of character development to show how things can go from a little bit rocky in chapter three to things go wrong in chapter four. I want mm -hmm. the things to not be contrived. I definitely okay. I definitely agree with that. That is a quite annoying. That is yeah. That, that's a, that's an admirable thing to try and avoid. That does the fact that you added that chapter later makes a little more sense to me too. Because and I, I mean I, I have to admit when I got to that point, I, I was kind of I, I was a little confused. I gotta admit, like it, it it felt like the stuff that just happened at the end of three hadn't been mentioned and such. But that that does make a little more sense now that that's been said. But no, yeah. that, that sorry, yeah. 
<laughs> I wanted to make sure that like every chapter showed almost like a different season. Like uh, chapter one, school is starting. It's summer. Goes to fall. Goes to winter. And I, I needed to pad things. Out, not pad things. I needed to stretch things out chronologically. I needed to show a little bit more development. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, sure, so. Next question is: uh, Do you have any advice for any aspiring writers out there on how to get started writing fan fiction? Well, I think the first thing you need to do is sit down and write. Because so many people say, I want to be a writer, or I'd love to be a writer, and they don't just sit down and write. One of my favorite science fiction writers, Isaac Asimov, would wake up, sit at his chair at 8 a.m. right in front of his typewriter, and just start writing. And I also recommend, uh, I've heard this referred to as the candy bar method of writing. Write the scenes that you really want to write, possibly out of order before you actually sit down and don't just try to do page one to page 50, page 300. Because then you get the scenes out which are fun for you and you can later connect them. Like the first scene I ever wrote of the Three Hooves was one of the scenes from the middle of the fourth and final chapter. I'm just like, this is really amazing. I want to get this idea out. And I worked toward that scene. Don't be afraid to jump around chronologically. Reward yourself saying, I want to write the scene where this happens to this. It's kind of like if you're writing a, a story where Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man are all hanging out, and you suddenly think while you're going through the first chapter, you know, I want to write that dialogue where Spidey is annoying the heck out of bats on a roof with batter, banter. Skip to that. <laughs> write two, three hundred words of that. Reward yourself. This should be fun. Thank you. That's a, mm. I'm going to. I'm writing that down at the moment so I can do that because I do. On my, I actually, oddly enough, I've mentioned on the podcast, I have Indie Works, a large Doctor Who's kind of thing in the progress. Awesome. And so I have, like, several scenes for season one planned out, like, I cannot wait to write this scene. This will be the best scene ever. And now I'm like, oh, wow, you mean I can just skip to that? Yes! Awesome. Do it if you're in the mood to write, but you aren't able to bridge that scene yet. You can't go to that place. Hmm. Write. Make sure you get something out. Thank you. That's some good advice that we haven't heard on here before. I actually want that's good. Well, I think I, what I love about that is every author we ask, I think we've heard two or three ever give the same answer to that question. Because there is so much advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can't remember. I think it was Anthropology's author, uh, Jason the Human, when he was on. He was giving one of my favorite pieces of advice, which was just uh, plan stuff, like not plan stuff, daydream. That was it. Think of how the story will go, how characters will react to each other, mm. how they will deal with each other, their personalities conflicting. All plan all of that stuff in your free time before you actually start writing, because that way you have somewhere to build off of. You know what you're doing. You know the characters a lot better. Absolutely. Mm. That is great advice. Yeah. Okay, okay. So. and last question. Who are your favorite professional authors, and how do you think they've inspired your writing? Well, Terry Pratchett. That's done a lot of my writing because I was going through my fan fiction, and I always, I always loved writing, loved creating. I stopped for a while uh, when I was an early teenager, threw all of my creativity into running role-playing games, and only within the past two years started writing again. And when I started rereading Terry Pratchett, I had always had a, a love of his sense of humor, but what I realized is that you can tell a description in a lot less than what most people assume. Um, in that, some people would describe rarity using an entire paragraph, but it sounds like you're reading off just a police description, just traits and stuff. But if you can do one or two sentences where you can describe everything about a character, uh, I have to use Mort again, where this is really where I first realized it, the big aha moment was when I was looking at it, and it described the main character in one sentence. And most books don't describe the main character in one sentence. They use a yeah. few paragraphs. And what Pratchett wrote was uh, he was a tall b boy who seemed to be made almost entirely out of knees and elbows. And that's really <laughs> descriptive. It gives you an idea of his frame, of his bearing. You have a picture in your head. So I started thinking, what can I say without saying? I mean, I, I am a firm believer in show, not tell. And, and that also influenced me. But there's also a 
say without directly coming out and saying it. You know, infer it in some way humorously or dramatically. And Pratchett really influenced me. Wow. Uh, uh, really good advice. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm also a huge H.P. Lovecraft fan, but I'm not sure how that directly relates to the ponies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I was going to say, uh, your piece of advice will remind me, I think I've mentioned on the very, 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 very first episode, when I had to answer these goddamn questions, <laughs> I said that my favorite author is Jim Butcher, and he will always be my favorite author. Yeah. But, and he gave me uh, the best advice I think I've ever had. Uh, he has this great live journal page where he talks about writing your own novel. And some of his best character stuff is just talking about uh, there. There are words that you should always that you should, adjectives that you should just attach to a character, and you should only use them when you're talking about that character. But you only use them once a scene, if that. Mm. Use it often enough so you, subconsciously the reader connects that word to that character. I like it. You know, I, I bet if I went back and read the books, those geeky werewolf kids, I would constantly find the same adjective used to describe them, yeah. and, and that makes the picture of the geeky werewolf kids in your head. Yeah, yeah. Huh. love that mm -hmm. uh, There's one so thing I, that always bothered me about the Jim Butcher series when I realized something. Harry Dresden is such a huge sci-fi nut, but every <laughs> electronic device breaks down. How does he watch it? He can't have a DVD player. Does he like, oh, no. like drive-ins? Yeah, he, he didn't say that. I think at one point in the book, Blue says he goes to a lot of driving. Cool, <laughs> cool. I always wondered about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And now we got one message for email time. We got one email from our good friend, Tricky Step. Hey. He says, hey, Roy and Sam, great to hear the show is back again. I haven't read Fall of the Quetcher and wasn't going to since I pl uh, never played the game or know anything about the universe. Oh. But I never know... I never knew you guys made. Uh, have, I never known that you guys have made a bad recommendation. So I'll hunker down and give it a shot. It probably won't be done in two weeks, but I'm excited all the same. I headed over to Seam to buy The Walking Dead the same night. I heard episode 18. I'm enjoying it thoroughly. Thanks, Sam. Oh, right, cool. If you guys ever do a Gilda-centered episode, I recommend getting Knickknack on as a guest, thanks to his story, Heart of Gold. Looking forward to the next episode. Peace out. For the record, right, now seriously, if you're enjoying The Walking Dead, you know the game. Just get the game. I have to recommend that higher than anything else. So, you know. I don't, anyway, I, that was, I just had to say that because my love for that game knows no bounds. Moving on. I've heard so many good things about that game, and yet it frustrates me. Why was there never a commercial for the game on Walking Dead? If it's one of the highest rated shows on TV, why could they not spare 30 seconds of airtime to advertise the game? Was there not? Really? That's really disappointing. Pointing. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to stop talking or else I'm going to go into a rant about how video games don't get proper respect in society and culture right now. Hey, but... hey, 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 Sam, you no, know you should, maybe you should stop fishing because yep. what, my favorite kind of that kind of show, Game of Thrones, there are no good games for it. The closest thing to a good game oh, like Game right. of Thrones is a board game, which is fantastic, mm. and there's a mod for Crusader Kings. That is, because yeah. Crusader Kings is basically Game of Thrones anyway. Yeah. So they just turned into That makes sense. That's, but there's no good commercial game for it. So. Yeah. Well, How could you not make a good Game of Thrones game? Uh, okay, let's move on. Cheap captions, you know, the usual. <laughs> Blood pressure rising. Yep. All right. <laughs> so, next part of the show, we're going to be talking about the theme. We're going to talk about background ponies. Now, last week we talked about OC ponies. And I, I mentioned that we're going to kind of talk about the difference in this week. So, what's the difference between making up an OC and talking about a background pony? In a lot of ways, it's the same difference from talking about a main six character or any other established character. You don't have to worry about an established personality. You can pretty much attach almost anything you want. There are base things, like Derpy is either clumsy or uh, unintelligent. Like She has some oddity about her. Or right. Lyra is at least happy a lot. Mm -hmm. or, or manic, rather. Yeah. That is part of her. Like you know, We can see that in the show. But besides that, we can attach whatever the hell we want. We can make Lyra love humans. We can make Lyra a really great musician, or we can make her kind of shitty musician. We can do whatever we want. And see, that's yeah. a, that's one of the things that I love about some of the ways that uh, the fandom and the fan fiction specifically has progressed. It's just with the background ponies, we pick up on such little things. You know, we see Lyra sitting kind of like a human does. No other pony does. And so then someone writes a fan fiction about Lyra believing that there are humans, and all of a sudden that's 
that may as well be canon at this point. You know, Bon Bon know has that. a different voice actress for every single line. Therefore, Bon Bon is obviously a voice actress. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, like, I, I also have to plug at that point Mendacity when Bon Bon is a changeling and just can yes. never, ever get her voice right. The moment yeah. that the changeling episode come out, I was going to write a Bon Bon is a changeling fic, but then Mendacity hit, I looked at my notes and realized it was written much better than my idea and just <laughs> totally dumped them into the Google Drive bin of garbage. Great <laughs> fic. I actually had that happen. I think I mentioned there was a fic where – I actually had commented on it on the guy's post. I was thinking about how to handle Colgate in my Doctor Who story, because I was like, well, she's obviously some kind of time pony. What the hell's going on with her? Hmm. And so I had several options, and one of them that I ended up not using was, what if the Doctor regenerated into Colgate? About a week later, someone posts a story on FIM Fiction in the featured box. Guess what? The Doctor regenerates, and it's Colgate. Hmm. And it was a funny comedy. I read a bit of it, but I commented like, you stop! Ah, oh, thank you. You actually forced my choice. <laughs> I, have no, I have no choice in the matter now. Yeah, there is that thing when you're in the fan fiction writing that you get an idea, but everyone is thinking along the same path, so you want to get that chapter one out before anyone else stakes a claim. That's why I'm working on a Lyra Bonbon story, and okay. it's an idea that I don't think I've seen before in the fandom, but I haven't mentioned anything about the idea, because I know the moment I do, someone will rush it out before I do. So I'm trying to get that done by summer at the latest. Oh. Yay! All right. Um, yeah, but so, but what's the bigger difference between backer ponies and OCs? Well, with OCs, the biggest problem you have is within any fandom, the OC can come across, it's easier for an OC to come across as either Mary Sueish or just flat, or... It's, it's harder to establish an OC than as a background pony because without you having to describe them, we know what they look like and we have at least some basic idea of who they are on some level, which you can then flesh out, which is a lot easier than making something and then throwing it at the audience, hoping that they'll enjoy it. I totally agree, especially because I've read so many terribly tedious description paragraphs about the mane and coat color of OCs. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, I long for the day when I can actually write a full story in first person, which will probably take a, be a long time in the future, but in first person, descriptions are the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> you're just like, I think they kind of look like this. You know? And I, you just color it however you want. Absolutely. And, I mean, we're talking about Jim Butcher. That's the great part about detective fiction. Whenever uh, a, a girl walks into a detective's office, they describe them using one or two sentences. You know, she was a yeah. tall glass of water, and her legs went all the way up. And there you go. You know. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking a lot when you said that. I was thinking, she walked in. Man, the fairy queen's got a nice ass. <laughs> That's just file. And the great part is when you're doing that, you're getting it both ways. You're getting characterization and you're getting description. Because how the first person sees it also tells us something about the first person. Yeah. I guess the other thing to bring up with background ponies is, unlike almost every other subject we usually talk on the show, there isn't much to compare to another fandom. They exist. There are a couple of them. Mm -hmm. But there isn't no there isn't another fandom where they go, hey, Let's look at these characters in the background and make names and stories all about them. <laughs> yeah, you don't get, like, Ensign number 17 on Next Generation having their own fic, usually. The, the most I can probably say for something where background has gotten their own fic is, um, uh, yeah, oh, you're, you're totally trumping me. You're right. The way that every single alien in the Moss Eisley Cantina has their <laughs> own biography Okay. It helped me in high school. I knew all of them. I was going to say, have you ever read <laughs> Star Trek novels? No. There was one series called New Frontier, where one of my favorite writers, Peter David, basically took background characters and made his own characters and staffed his own ship. So since it wasn't the main characters on the show, he could have romances, pregnancies, marriages, deaths, because he could play around with his own little backgrounds. But you're right. We are unique. As, as a fandom, because we have this. I really can't think of any other fandom that does this, because even, like, with the other Star Wars characters, that's expanded universe. That's still, you know, mm -hmm. sold in Barnes & Noble. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, the, um, I've heard of the new frontier before. I'm not a big Trekkie. I'm trying to dip into it. Um, thanks to SF Debris, I'm starting to know which episodes are good to watch and which ones I should stay away from at, like, a 10 <clears throat> Radius. Yeah, don't but, watch any episode that involves uh, ghosts inside candles. 
Okay. Thank, thank you. All right. But uh, what I was going to say is that the only thing I was thinking of, like, I really went, wait a minute, Star Wars, inspiration. But what I was coming to think about was the only thing I could guess where I was like, I, I can see it, is because they put that much work into it, is, uh, I think I've pointed this out to Sam before, in uh, The Melancholy of Harley Susan Mia, at least the mm. first season, the background characters in the high school are all really well drawn. And I mean drawn in such a way where almost every single one of them looks like they could be the star of their own show, or at least a main character. They they look, they have a look to them that is very character if you get what I'm saying. It isn't just a random face in the background. No, they spent time and effort designing them, and from what I've seen, they're very consistent. Like, these, these background characters are in this class, and these are in this class. So, it'd be easily possible to do it there. I just haven't seen it done. Probably yeah, a lot of that in Japan, I guess. Hmm? Yeah, there might be a lot of that in Japan, perhaps. Uh, but I wouldn't know how to start looking for that. And for the record, if any of you, did, because this reminded me of this and made me want this, if any of you listeners can find a fan fiction either about the cabbage guy or the foamy mouth guy from Avatar The Last Airbender, <laughs> I will love you for all time. Okay? Just He'll please, love you a long time. Yes. Please, someone start that search. Oh, and just to remind everyone, um, I have two ongoing challenges going on. Anyone can find me a good Twixie fic or a fic that stars Bon Bon but not Lyra, you win my affection and I will read it all. Has that still not happened? And are you sure they That's would win your still not happening. Are you sure they would win your affection for the Twixie fic or earn your eternal life? It ire? depends if I like it. If I like it, then they win. Yeah, so I would love to see that too. Time. <laughs> Every time I read a Twixie fic about chapter nine, it jumps the shark totally. I read one fic, and then it gets into a really weird relationship. There was another fic that became such an embarrassment that the author had to re-edit his own chapter because it involved Celestia near date-raping Big Mac in the kitchen while Twilight's what? parents were in the other room. Whoa. And it was gone what? the day after the update. Yes, yeah, I forget what the name of it is, but every time I've read a good Twilight and Trixie fic, it's like, and then she puts on a mysterious mask and leaves to wander the wilds. I'm like, what the smeg is going on? <laughs> they always jump the shark. I've literally read one good Trixie romance story, and I have another one that looks interesting. But And that one was with an OC. So I don't, you know, Trixie, I, I, I think it can work. I just haven't seen it happen. Agreed. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, yeah, another one, yeah, the Bon Bon one. Because every single thing I've ever found Bon Bon, Lyra is at least in it. But, okay. <sighs> deep breaths, deep breaths. All right, so move on. Let's talk about choices. I'm pretty sure, as always, there's some people who've never heard of it. They're like, choices? What the hell is that? Well, I will tell you. Choices is a fic about, as he kind of mentioned earlier, Derpy, or rather Ditsy, um, Lyra, and Shirley, all in college. It's, oh, and Doctor Who's in it quite a bit, but... And um, you might think, oh, what a fun romp. No, it is not a fun romp. Which Roy failed to inform me of. <laughs> he was just kind of like, oh, yeah, hey, we're going to read this fic for the next episode. And I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, college with Lyra. And, uh, okay, yeah, no, th th this will be fun. I'm all for this. No, no, it's not. <laughs> I put fun and rompiness in it. It's just Oh, yeah, no, no, there is. is. There is fun and rompiness, just, you know, along about chapter three, um, the scene with Lyra in the bathroom and that one big flash flashback, or that might have been chapter four, I, I forget exactly. Um, I, I was just, I, I started talking to Roy on Facebook, I'm just like, this got a lot darker than I expected. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good, that's not a complaint at all, I, I, I love having unexpected, serious drama in my stuff, I just, <laughs> I was sitting there like, this was not what I expected at all. It was it was very interesting. It's real good though. It does a very good job with it all. Yeah. Thank you. Let's say final Octavia University days. This is not. Yeah. Um, which I still love that. It's completely it's the opposite end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But yes. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this. I think I read this a while back. If you look back through our archives, you will find that I did talk about it after I finished it. But that was a long time ago. But yeah, I do. Really enjoy this. It did win in a lot of areas I didn't expect. As you said, it, the drama is not from typical cliche things, but simply from personality conflicts, from almost uh, literally just clashes with who they are that just doesn't work. Some people are too prideful, and some people are, are sort of ponies. 
are too compassionate for their own good. Yeah. And um, I would also like to say, he, we disagreed on this. You said that you thought Lyra's dad was the worst, most horrible pony in the entire thing. I am sorry, <laughs> but uh, what's that kid's name? The guy who set out to destroy Ditsy? I do oh, see yeah. your argument on that. He, because, I mean, he's, he went out through all of this trouble to do so. From the smallest thing. Yeah. It's like, it reminds me of a storyline in Batman when Penguin, some guy thought he was laughing at him, so he ruined his life and made him commit suicide. And he didn't even know if that was the guy who laughed at him. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. When I was writing Lyra's Dad, and, and I loved, in that story, I get to use all of their parents. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so much that I had to write another Doctor Who story where the Doctor meets Ditsy's parents. Uh, <laughs> and I love Lyra's, yeah, Doctor Who's and the House of Daring. It's also got Daring doing it. Check it out. <laughs> but uh, I, Lyra's dad does what he does because he loves her. But I have known parents who will do the horribly wrong decision or the Machiavellian Batman gambit, I'm doing this for your own good. Yeah. And what Lyra's dad does is hideously manipulative. But he really wants things to be better for Lyra. Whereas, oh, I can't even remember the name of that jerk. <laughs> he, he is a... Starshine or something like that? So, oh, um, it involved a star because there's a joke. But he, yeah. he is a you know, self-absorbed bad pony. Yeah. And I definitely wanted to get that out. He is, like, he's the kind of pony, if he met Blue Blood, Blue Blood would be like, whoa, whoa. Calm down, dude. Yeah, Star Trek. You're, you're going too far. Yeah. No, it, it, it definitely... I had the strongest reaction to Lyra's father just because that's kind of a parenting pet peeve of mine. I hate to see parents do crap like that. And he did, he, he did do more, like, a, you know, just a greater amount of terrible stuff than Starshine. But, yeah, once I talked to Roy about it and he pointed that simple fact out that I should not have missed, that, yeah, Starshine did something really horrible to someone for quite possibly the least legitimate reason I can I can think of at all. The most petty. Yeah, yeah and I was thinking oh, when so I was writing that, it. you know, like, kind of <laughs> office politics. If you go into the offices or universities, there's there you can always find that one relationship where one person does something innocuous or does something they don't even notice, and someone takes it in absolutely the wrong way. Or someone has used someone else as an emotional scapegoat. This person looked really good at that meeting where I did poorly at. It wasn't the fault of my PowerPoint. I'm going to destroy this person. <laughs> and while it's over the top in some ways, you can still see that's kind of a thing people still do. I hoped yeah. he didn't never became a snidely whiplash twirling his mustache kind of character. In your no, he did. He became a, oh my god, I hate you, please, please die. And the resolution yeah. for him was highly satisfactory. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I was very happy about how that worked. <laughs> I am so tempted to make a throwaway line to his eventual fate in another Doctor Who story, but I, 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 I like the way he ended up there, and I, I wanted to hit him with the karma hammer as bad as possible. Yeah. You see, I actually want to ask you about that, because as a writer, I've always had the problem for my influences. I like, if I don't want my villains to be sympathetic, they have to at least be somewhat more believable. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I slightly tend towards more sympathetic and anti-villains, simply because I always have to think through all their motivations and who they are, and I always hate the, I really hate the idea of, oh, well, they're just evil, yeah. that kind of bullshit. Absolutely agree, and surprise, and say, sorry, I, you, I'm sorry, you circumvented it so much, where you had a believable character who was so much of an asshole, yeah. he would still believe, but he, yet he still felt genuine. Yes, and I think despite the fact that you may not call him the deepest writer, the advice that I always go for on that, I got from Stan Lee. Now, oh. he, he gave some advice about Marvel villains, and this does not in any way apply to the Red Skull, because he didn't create the Red Skull. But when Stan Lee was running the House of Ideas, the thing that he always said about Marvel villains is that every single one of them thinks of themselves as a hero, and would yeah. be a hero except for one flaw. Dr. Doom, if he could give over his pride, could probably rule the world pretty fairly. Mm. I mean, the Kingpin kind of views himself as, I could control this city. But, and, and all of my villains, even the most despicable ones, generally have to view themselves as the good guy. Even when I write Discord in his most horribleness, because I have two different versions of Discord, 
He really does think everyone lacks a sense of humor, and it's really unfair that the audience isn't responding to me. So maybe that's why I'll trap all these people in their own worst nightmares. The bad guy always has to believe they're the good guy. I've heard that same advice all the time. Yeah, everyone is the hero of their own story. And if if they don't think of themselves as a hero, it's because they they they, they disillusion themselves to the idea of heroes or morality. If they're that kind of character. Yeah. Where they're like, oh yeah, I'm not a bad guy because there's no such thing as a bad guy. You do what you can to survive. Mm -hmm. That yeah. kind of guy. Totally. Agree. And in that case, you never have a character when they're just they're like, yes, I am an evil person. I do evil. <laughs> yeah, because they're just not interesting. In the modern age, even the Joker has kind of a reason for it in the best written stories. When the Joker is like, the entire world is this nihilistic joke. Why aren't you laughing? Which is much more interesting than, ha, Batman, I stole the giant cheese wheels. Catch me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, another author I've selected, so have you ever heard, uh, we talked about last week, or I did, there's a fic called a Pagliacci in which Pinkie Pie is the Joker. Ooh. It's really good. It's I said it's the only fic that in less, like, literally about a sentence can make you go from kind of laughing to scared shitless. So and it, is this... it, it drives the tension so fast that you're scared. So in that case, this wouldn't be, like, Laughing Fish Joker or uh, I'm going to pull the biggest boner Joker. No. This is Killing Joker. <laughs> This is yes. This is mur this is effectively com like Dark Knight Rises. Uh, no, Dark Knight, the Dark Knight slash um, modern comics Joker or okay. uh, Joker: The Last Laugh, especially kind of reminds me of that. Uh, and it's and it's it's very believable and very well done. And it has hints that there's a kind of Batman in the city or Batman, I would suppose. And there's apparently versions of the other main six who are super villains because at least she says something about meeting up with her old friend. And I'm like, if there is a crazy Twilight uh, Riddler, <laughs> all of the yes. My friend and I once started brainstorming the best matchups for the main six and Batman villains, and we got oh, kind of screwy. Oh, the Penguin. Oh, I, I must disagree. If you Ooh. want someone who is a Batman villain, who is focused on something, something, giant hat, and making <laughs> people act proper, Rarity is the Mad Hatter. Oh, oh. that's good. I have to go and see. I thought the way I... I uh, Penguin I can I, see. Yeah, Penguin I can see because Penguin is that villain where he's, he's the upper, cl upper class of crime. He, he always kind of... He's never, he's never insane. He's never been to an insane film in his life. He just commits crime because he has nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. And he has he's a very wealthy, uh, what's the word? He feels very upper class. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, for a while, you know, he was legit. He was running that nightclub, and no one can yeah. touch him. Yeah, and that that is a cool villain. When, you know, when Superman can drop in on Lex Luthor because he knows the office, it can make much more interesting stories than, there's Lex Luthor, let's throw him in jail. Yes. <laughs> now, so, I, Twilight... Cut Lex, sorry. Cut Lex Luthor a track. Twilight would be good as the Riddler. But I love a lot of the obscure Batman villains. And if we go off Lesson Zero, I th and Batman the Animated Series, I think she'd make an amazing Clock King. Ooh! Oh, oh I can see that. Clock King is so underutilized. Oh, that'd be great. Yes, yes, he is. And, I mean, you, you look at his costume in the comics, and they got that giant clock on his face. And then you watch the cartoon, and he's like, but the thing you don't know, Batman, is that Gotham Express is always 15 minutes late, and he jumps off the bridge onto the train. That was amazing. Mm. Or how he timed his he timed the explosion to be just faster than he could disarm the bomb. Like that's genius. Oh yes. Uh, yeah, clocking. We have so derailed this. Yeah. I don't care. Batman comic shark. No, uh, but yeah, that's a really good story, and it goes so many unexpected places. But it ties back and, into what we're talking about because Clock King assumes he's the good guy. Yes. Well, he does. Well, yeah, he. What was it? He uh, well, he didn't mean to hurt you. He did much more than that. He made me late. Yes. Yep. That guy's so crazy. And he got an appearance on Justice League, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, in the Suicide Squad episode. Which they didn't call it that, obviously, because they couldn't, but still. Yeah. <sighs> Goddamn censorship. Oh, well. Anyway, let's move on. Now we're going to talk about updates. Sam, I'm going to go quickly. Did you have anything? No, nope, hold on. Okay. <laughs> 
Talia Prince, is there any ongoing fics you read that are, have updated lately? Well, uh, I am eagerly awaiting the end of The Best of All Possible Worlds, because I have loved how the philosopher Voltaire ends up in Equestria and promptly begins to troll the heck out of Celestia with the idea of making her a better ruler. And I believe that's near ending in the, I think it has one or two chapters left, and it's been an incredible ride. Aside from that, there's this other fic I'm following, which has promise. I'm going to have to check to see what it is, in that it's, it's one of the weirdest shipping fics I've seen. It's Pinkie Pie and Celestia. And it's... What? Yes. And it's actually working. Uh, it's, it's this fic in which Pinkie Pie and Celestia have been... Um, uh, What's the name? I look twice as bright by Cloudy Skies. Um, and Pinkie Pie goes to Celestia and realizes she's sad, and, and we don't know what's going inside Pinkie Pie's head, because it's never done from Pinkie Pie's perspective. Even though it's third person, sure. it describes what Celestia is thinking. But uh, it's moving at just the right pace, so it's not one chapter and then they kiss. So that's a really good one. Mm. Aside from that, something that I hope is going to be updating soon is The Social Experiment by Other Matt, which is the second part of a Caramel Twilight shipping fic, which was also really good because it starts out with a really good reason to put those two together. Uh, wait, wait, no. Um, the Social Experiment is the first fic, and the currently updating one is called Variables. My bad. Okay. okay. So, um, I just looked, and I, there actually is one, and it makes me happy. Um, I, I haven't read it yet, of course, because I just found it, but I think I mentioned, um, or I might have mentioned in the past, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, a dinky pipsqueak piece. What? Uh, oh, oh, well, no, that's when we're talking about other fix related to the, sorry. yeah, no, that's different. Um, this is a, it's just called Pony Shorts. The author is, uh, Miyajima, and he just, basically just whenever he thinks of a little idea that can make a story and a couple, th you know, a bunch of little one-shots, he just updates this. And there are a bunch of really fun things here from, you know, I, I did, from creation myths for Equestria to Ooh. random little stupid shipping things like Tom with Bloomberg, with Bloomberg and <laughs> <laughs> and even, even a little fic that presents the idea that fog would make it really difficult for Pegasi to walk around. Um, and so, like, oh, oh just a bunch I of... Like that. Yeah, just a bunch of really creative little things. Um, he just calls it Pony Shorts and updates it now and again, and he just did, apparently, like a little while ago. So I'm Ooh. going to check that out. And apparently also, I've mentioned this one a few times, how every ship pick would actually happen. Oh, that um, one is brilliant. Yes, um, that apparently just updated, and I am scared. It updated with... The, the idea of this pick, for those of you who might not have heard me talk about it in the past is just a bunch of little shorts that show how every popular ship in this fandom could go horribly wrong and why it wouldn't actually work. Um, usually it resolves in less than a hundred words. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's some good stuff in here. And the new one is Apple Mac. Uh -oh. So I will be happy to see that one get the smack down, but I'm kind of scared about it as well. But I'm happy that it's updated, so... Yeah. Cool. Okay, Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so I had four things to update, uh, which is weird because it was two weeks. I usually get more updates than that. Fanfic writers, all of us, we're, we're slacking off. I know <laughs> I have. All right, so there's My Little Changeling Friendship is Weird by your old friend Nia, Nia Ruzu. Right. I never knew how to pronounce that guy's name. <laughs> and a uh, very interesting chapter. i uh, really loving where this series is going. Uh, it's actually breaking away from the every week this kind of thing happens. It's actually breaking off into hints of some further plot lines and subplots, which I'm like, yay, good! Because oh, I love what's been going on. The idea that it's actually going to get more of a plot to it is also great. Huh. Though I do love the random silly adventure thing. Um, there's What's in a Name by Key Tapper, which is that great fic where it's, uh, you know, Pinkie Pie loses her memory, and now she uh, loses her cutie mark and is Pikamina again. And yeah, that updated. And huh. it's going really good. Good. It was funny and heartwarming, and I'm. It's the light is starting to shine, and I'm interested to see how it's finally going to burst. I'm ex really excited to see where that one. I goes. fell behind on that one. I need to catch up. I, I know, really like the beginning of that. Uh, and then, oh, uh, like two days ago, the Dresden Phillies, but uh, false masks by the psychic scuba diver. 
finally updated. Yes. I love it, because I think updates is like 8,000 words every time. So it's like, yes, time for more. <laughs> and I don't think I... I don't think there's anything I haven't said about this. Uh, just read it. If you... Even if you don't know anything about the Dresden Files that we've mentioned so times, if you never heard of it, know nothing about it, just read this thing. All you need to know is Dresden is a wizard. That's pretty much oh. it. He's a wizard private investigator. More specifically, though, we did start with... You go. The, let's start with the first one, Strange Friends. Not yeah, Paul's Strange Masks, that's the sequel. Anyway, sorry, go on. <laughs> I was going to say the best way that Butcher always describe Harry Dresden is, Hello, my name is Harry Dresden. I'm the only wizard you'll find in the phone book. Yes. That and um, the building was on fire and it wasn't my fault. Yes, I love that line. That's one of the greatest openings to a novel ever. Uh, I think that book ends with a good one, too. I'm actually right now listening, uh, re-listening to the audiobook for, for uh, White Knight, and they'll go on from there, because the audio, that was like a peak of audiobook quality for that series, like or around that area. I, I never finished Changes yet in audio. What number book is that? Uh, White Knight's number nine. Oh, wow. Okay, I have a while to go. I'm on number three. <laughs> White Knight is fantastic. It, it, it is a, it's actually it the second book I read in the series that's one of my favorites. It was Easy. great. It, it, it examined some of the most interesting side characters and fleshed them out Carlos. quite a bit. Carlos. Carlos. Huh. I love Carlos Ramirez. Or Carlos, yeah, it's Ramirez, yeah. He's one of my favorites. Um, I like, I just got the scene, there's this whole part where Dresden just loses his shit. He goes... So, Something pushes him too far, and he makes an example of a monster, and it's scary, because you're in his head, and he's just coldly ho doing these horrible things to admittedly monsters, but they, you know, they're sapient, they're sentient, and it's chilling, and it's scary as hell, and I always love when he does shit like that. And then, I need to actually look up who the author of this one is, because I don't have that readily available. Wait, I might. Yes, I do. Okay, so this is called A Brief History of Equestria by Canine the First. And I found this one and then it updated so it counts. This fic is amazing. The basic idea is um, after the Halloween, after um, Nightmare Night, uh, Luna, having found out that most ponies don't know who Starswold the Bearded is, tells her sister and they're like, what? How does no one know, does no pony know who Starswell the Beard is? So, they commissioned Twilight Sparkle to write a brief history of all of Equestria to catch up everyone on what they've missed. You know, what they forgot in school, basically. And so it is a history book of Equestria written by Twilight. Mm. And it is amazing. Because it feels like a really well done history, world history book. Like, it starts off really early on, where they're like, we don't really know. We have some old traditions, and we have some anth a little more anthropological evidence, but we have to make a lot of assumptions based off of it, and that's all we have. And I'm like, that's what history is! Yay! And then it got to, it talked, so far it's uh, spent a lot of time on the heartwarming Eve era, and it is so funny, so well done, that, oh, like, it's that's hard to each of them... Each of the leaders is based very much off of real life people, uh, you know, very much fleshed out. Like um, Commander Hurricane, who's the only male of the founders, he uh, they base him very much, kind of off of Caesar, but also a lot off of um, um, Andrew J uh, Andrew Jackson. Oh wow, great so voices. He's, he's really interesting. Um, oh, and my love is. Um, what's your name, Smart Cookie, is really based off John Adams. In fact, there's like a direct line from se uh, 1776, the play, that they give like, I'm obnoxious and disliked by, uh, don't you see? Like, it's the exact same line, like, John Adams! And she was a lawyer, and she really fits. Okay, I have to ask then, who do they base Muffin Head or Cupcake Head? Or pudding Head. I was going to get to Pudding Head. Pudding Head, some people point out that she's kind of a Caligula, she kind of is, but she's more based off a um, person named Joshua Norton. Yes! Emperor Joshua Norton. First Emperor of the United States. Yes! Yes. Who people don't know this. This was a guy in San Francisco who went crazy and declared himself Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico. And, ever, and he was such a nice guy. And he was so polite. And he was 
he was a cool person. So everyone just played along with it. And it he was just this crazy dude. Yeah. And, and he minted his own money, and it was accepted. He actually corresponded with Abraham Lincoln. He was friends with Mark Twain and said, you will be the official chronicler of the United States. And he suggested, you know, sometime we really should make a bridge between San Francisco and Oakland. That might be a good a, idea. And a tunnel. He also suggested a tunnel underneath the bay, which also happened on. Uh, and also, Mark Twain based the character The King in uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn off of, directly off of Joshua Norton. And uh, the other funny thing is that his, when he died, uh, 30,000 people showed up to his funeral, and there was a solar eclipse. He had style. He had style. But yeah, putting his face over, so like there's this whole thing when it's talking about that thing where um, they had a meeting. In the, in the show, you know, and they're all arguing. And it's supposed to be a peace talk, but it just goes horribly. There's, beforehand, it spends all this time with the other two leaders, talking about how their personality just would not mesh and why it turned out this way. Like, Commander Kirk Kane was so used to giving orders and people doing what he said. That is what he was used to. He, he was not used to being among equals. And the King of the Unicorns was so used, uh, he didn't have any say in it. He had to appease all of his court of nobles and had absolutely no say in what he did. And so trying to appease all of them, he couldn't really do anything for any of the other races. And then it gets to Pudding. It just says, Pudding here with Mother Bucking insane. And then it continues on. Awesome. Uh, there's a lot of great references. There was one reference that turned me on to a meme from Warhammer 40K, which is one of my favorite memes now, which is, um, Greed! If, you, if any of the listeners get that joke. Then you will understand. I ain't going to have to check that out. Uh, I have a quick question. You mentioned yes. that what's in a name fic. When I yeah. put that into Fimfic, I keep hitting one about Rainbow Dash, and you said it was about Pinky. So what is the author of What's in a Name? Do you know off the top of your head? I wrote it down. Uh, what's in a name? It's like Key Tapper. Cool, cool. Thanks. Yeah, no problem at all. Anyway, let's move on. So let's talk about fix. Recommend some fix about the background ponies. Uh... We'll reverse the order, so I'll go first this time. I got three, but I'll be sharing the last one with Sam. Yep. So first one, it's Only Human, Lyra the Cartoonist, by Smoking Gun. It's a fic in which uh, Lyra is just out of uh, art school and is trying to pitch her idea to the studios for the new hit show for kids. Oh, I think, like, it's literally the, uh, the studio she's pitched to is, like, hub or something. Like, it's obviously supposed to be the hub. Um, she's trying to pick her show Only Human, about these creatures she made up called humans. <laughs> and it's, and, it, and like, she's terrible at art. Like, it's all stick figures. Um, and they're all, every, like every other studio, they all completely just get, saying, all these guys say, no, we're not doing this, it's terrible. Uh, except one at the pub. Takes her under her wing, the executive Bon Bon goes, let's work, hammer this out. Let's, there is a great story here. There is a story here that kids will love, and that will, that will be a family show. And I'm going to make sure it's made. Right. And so she, t- she takes her under her wing. And, oh, and Derpy runs a uh, donut shop and is Lyra's best friend. I believe roommate. That's hilarious. Um, and so they also start almost a romantic relationship. While Derpy, the time, is going, dude, she's just, think about it, she's using you to get further in her career. This could turn out terrible. It doesn't matter if she actually likes you. This could, if she goes down, you go down. And it's really well done. <laughs> and it's just a great idea anyway. Lyra is a cartoonist. I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is a great fic. I was going to recommend that one. That's a good one. Yes. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to say about it? I'll top of your head. I want it to update more. <laughs> yes, me too. It hasn't updated since I started reading it. Uh, then there's My Little Person, The Lyle Hartman Story by Fernan, which is, at seemingly at first, uh, your average kind of body suit, like this guy named Lyle Hartman wakes up and he's in Lyra's body. What's going on? I am not going to say a single thing more than that about this story. <laughs> I will only say that it goes in a completely different direction than any of the other body-switching human-to-pony stories, and it is so worth your time to read that. Um, another one which me and Sam are sharing is of apples and roses and thick purple proses. Oh. My good friend Raven's Dagger 
who, if the name sounds familiar, is also the one who wrote that fic about Featherweight trying to get uh, Scootalo to go out with him. Oh, I hadn't even caught that, and I still really need to read that fic. <laughs> yeah, same author. And also, oddly enough, uh, Murray told you that at, when finishing it, uh, he brought up, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this other thing, uh, spin off about Dinky. Um, yeah, that actually started, so I had to bookmark that. It's about Dinky, uh, Dinky's um, elementary school life pining after some cold. And I'm in, I'm looking forward to reading that one. Huh. But yes, so this fic of apples and uh, of apples and roses and thick purple roses is about Rosebud. And wow, a fic about Rosebud. Rose and not a, a Rose Luck, yeah. Cane. Rosebud was the slut. Damn. Yeah, watching too much Susan <laughs> Kane. Were you? <laughs> so Rose Luck. Um, at, oddly enough, uh, the way every time I've seen her and stuff is they bring in the other two apple uh, flower shop girls. Which they did this time. Like, they mentioned them, and they're, apparently they still exist, but Rose Luck is the one who runs the flower shop. Mm-hmm. And her best friend is Raindrops, <laughs> who is another background pony that gets no love. Uh, um, and a great character in this thing. And really yes, loved Raindrops. Raindrops is great. So, yeah, she it runs the flower shop, but she's also a poet. And she's once, and there's an upcoming poet, uh, what's the word for it? Poet recital competition kind of thing? Something poet like slam. that. But poet not really slam. a poetry slam, because it's much more. But they call it a slam. That. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so last, she's, apparently Derpy beats her every single year. <laughs> so this time she's determined she's going to win. Um, and at the same time, uh, she is a, um, she's, she's enamored with Big Mac, and a romance starts there. And it's really good. Yeah, it I, I just lot. started it today. It's really good. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, we yeah. just all That's... found this around the same time, I guess. <laughs> I literally, it was in my folder really deep, and I was like, I should read that for this episode. So we, I think we all read that today. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just she looking around for background pony stuff that I could read to recommend in this section, and I'm all like, I don't even know who this background pony is. I'll just see if there's anything interesting <laughs> on the fix. So. There was. Rose Luck is a good character. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Yes, so that's a really, really well done fic. What's interesting is there are multiple writers. Well, Raven Staggers has all of the narration and a few of the poems. Most of the poems are written by different authors. Yeah. Each time, you know, they'll grab someone in to do each uh, poem. And the poems are usually very well done. Mm-hmm. I think there's a few that are like, meh. But a lot of them are, especially all the ones uh, by a certain red-coated stallion are amazing. Oh, man, it's yeah. It's a really good collaboration idea. Oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And yeah, I, oh, go ahead. Well, plus just some of, the, some of the ponies that you actually get to see up there. Oh, man, it's great. I, like, uh, I'll try not to ruin too much. I, like, I actually do, but yeah, Snowflake is up there, whatever his name is, and uh, Snips and Snails go against each other <laughs> and with poetry. Awesome. And um, and Doctor Who's as well. Snails was the one who was creepy. His poem oh, yeah, no, Snails was... You're awful! Stop yeah. saying things! Also, Twilight's, Twilight's uh, poem is... About Quark. It's wonderful. <laughs> Before he even started reading it, like, I was just reading it, and I got to that part, and I was like, ah, Twilight had a poem about So it's kind of similar to the fic Naked Singularity, where she writes romance stories, and they end up sounding like Stephen Hawking mixed with Harlequin romances. Wait, what? <laughs> what was this fic called again? It's called Naked Singularity, and Twilight starts writing romance fiction, but she uses these really contrived physics metaphors. And it's absolutely <laughs> hilarious. That's amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. But no, so what, uh, my favorite thing is, like, she does this whole poem about quarks, and the, they kind of like it, and the best thing is, uh, the main, uh, Rose like this, because, what's a quark? <laughs> yep. And I laugh because I'm like, I'm willing to bet, like, two-thirds of the people who read this don't know what a quark is. Yep. <laughs> uh, uh, Sorry, I love this. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it's good. It, it, it was a very fun fic, and I recommend that everyone read it. And beyond that, the romance is actually done pretty well, too, especially the stuff from Rose Luck's perspective. It was... Rose Luck's a great character. Yeah. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention. Um, they did something, and I want to start, and I would say, this is a good idea that isn't used very often, that uh, how Earth Pony Magic is done. Oh, yes. It's literally like she is able to connect to the tree's life force and heal it. Yeah, yeah. it's like shamanism. I had never seen it used in any fic like that before. Me either. It blew like, me away. Was I was cool. thinking, no, it's like, must try this idea. It sounds <laughs> bad. Yeah, that's but, good stuff. Yeah. 
Very, very good. Yeah. So, uh, Sam, do you have any other things to recommend? Yes. Um, well, I've got that, and then... Well, okay, I'm just going to give this one a quick mention, because uh, I've mentioned it before, and I unfortunately have not gotten much farther than before, but it just makes sense that in an episode like this, I would mention Background Pony. Still oh. have not gotten too far in it, but really love what I have read, and beyond that, it still just has some of the most beautiful prose of any fanfic I've read. I mean, I mean, you know, like, I've enjoyed reading most of the fanfics I've read for one reason or another, but this is one where just reading the words is a pure joy. And so I, I, I must recommend that very highly. Um, and then one... Okay, a while ago, I realized that I really liked this idea, so I had to see if it actually happened. There is a fic called Pirates for a Day, and it is just... A fic, a pretty short one-shot fic, like 2,500 words or so, about Pipsqueak and Dinky pretending to be pirates when they're little kids. And it is just absolutely adorable. I mean, not not even really, it, it doesn't go all out shipping on it. It's just, you know, it's two little kids that are playing around. And it's definitely one of the most daw-inducing fanfics I've ever read, you know, right up there with the Sultan Fort book and stuff like that. Um, so I, I, I would definitely recommend that one as well. It's it's it, rather adorable. It is a good one. Is that the one which is a prequel to the uh, Dinky Pipsqueak shipping story Eternity? Because I think both of those are by the same author. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I, I had forgotten the title of the sequel, actually, but yeah. it's. Um, I believe that it was written first, that, that Pirates for a Day was um, but in, in any case, yeah, it's uh, those two are definitely connected. Eternity takes it into a more shipping thing and kind of goes through their whole life, which it was also very good. So, yeah. Okie dokie. Uh, Pallia, do you have anything you'd like to recommend? Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, for background ponies, uh, it wasn't the first one written, but I'm going to recommend Rainbow Double Dash's Lunaverse. Uh, longest day, l Longest Night, Longest Day. And the Lunaverse, which he's trying to uh, Lovecraft Circle style, ask other writers to help him flesh out with more stories, is his alternate Equestria, where Celestia goes nuts, becomes Corona, gets trapped in the sun, and Luna okay. rules Equestria for the next thousand years. And in oh, this, uh, in this oh. world, uh, the uh, student of Luna, Trixie, is sent to Ponyville, to run stuff, and the elements of harmony become Cheerly, Raindrops, Carrot Top, Lyra, and Der Derpy. And it's, it's really good, and Longest Day, Longest Night is, what would the first two-parter be with these characters? Hmm. Can I quickly cut in? Go ahead. Uh, I think that was a great description. I was going to say, we have talked about Lunaverse fix before, rather Sam has. Yeah, well, oh. uh, well, I read one of them, the very first one that was written based on Ghostbusters. And I really liked it. I, I kind of wanted to read more of the Lunaverse, but I haven't yet. I haven't tried it yet. I think it's interesting. I'd like to. I've been meaning to write a uh, Doctor story set in the Lunaverse, but I Ooh. just... They're, they're making a series Bible, which is a good thing, because I don't know what has been done with it, and I don't want to do something in, you know, like, episode 13 of the Lunaverse directly contradicts it. So I'm, I'm waiting until Rainbow Double Dash can Let's get a series Let's hope it's not Bible. like a... It's mm. like a Roddenberry series Bible where it's like, you can't do these things because I think they're dumb. No, he's, he's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying, that would suck. Uh, my other, my next two stories, one of them is by Clav de Caesar, and it's Ditsy Doo's Dismally Derpy Day, and he has a few really <laughs> well done Ditsy Doo stories, and one really incredible uh, Ponies versus the Cthulhu Mythos story, but what? he has what? really what? good, yes. Yes, re yeah, and, it, and it's done so it doesn't seem out of place. It's not gratuitous. And, and there's a really amazing nod if anyone plays the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Uh, let me just say that there is a uh, paranormal investigator pony named Delta Green. But the story <laughs> I'm recommending is Ditsy Doo's Dismally Derpy Day, and that has some uh, shipping with Ditsy Doo and Big Mac, which is later continued into some of his other stories. Whoa. And that's really good. And finally, Happily Ever After is a story in which Lyra and Bon Bon are about to get married, and their parents and other people want to stop it, and it's up to Pinky to make sure the we and her other friends to make sure the wedding happens. And Ooh. it's also really good and really funny. So Happily Ever After by Vanner 
is is I'm another one. I'm going to look that. Up. Hmm. Yeah. Definitely. All right, and so I was going to say before we move on to the next part, which I'm for sure I'm the only one has recommendations for that area. Uh, I would like to say quickly, since we're talking about background pony fix, I don't expect anyone to actually read it because. They were my first. They are my first stories. But yes, I have written several fix that center around background ponies. I'll put them in the description. Please don't. I am terrible. Okay. So shameless plug. They're done. Now for non-pony background-ish kind of character stuff, uh, I have three things. Uh, one isn't really a fix, but it definitely counts. I still need to read it myself, but I definitely want to. It's a, a book called Death Star. And the idea is oh. it shows in episode four different perspectives from all these different characters aboard the Death Star. Neat. And the one I know of and that is the most interesting is that one of them, he has like one scene in the movie pressing buttons for the Death Star. He has like one line saying it can't fire yet. Is that the guy with the really weird black curved hat? Yes, I think so. <laughs> so it goes from his perspective. And the thing is, after they destroyed Alderaan, he had no idea what they were doing when that happened. He found out later that he just he helped kill an entire planet's worth of people. And so he's so stricken with grief and so horrified by what happened that he's lying. He could have fired at that point, but stalled it so the Death Star would be blown up and he would you know, he basically committed committing suicide to save to save everyone. And I'm like, that's a cool idea. Yeah. And then I think the ultimate in background character stuff is a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead by Tom Stoppard. Oh, yes. Which is my favorite play of all time. That I'm per- is I'm technically currently- kind of background character. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm currently in my acting class. I'm doing a scene from it. I am Guildenstern. <laughs> so, um, gentle Guildenstern. And I absolutely love this. For those of you who don't know, um, I'm... I think there's like two or three people on the planet I've at least heard of Hamlet, but a lot of people probably don't remember. In fact, for a long time, these characters were cut out in adaptations, or even you know, things of the play. They just cut the scenes with them. And there's characters, Rose and Krantz and Guildenstern, who are two friends of Hamlet, who uh, the king and queen uh, bring to go, hey, try and cheer him up, he's gone crazy. So the, this play is through their perspective. It's what is a character in a play doing when they're not on screen? When they're not on stage, what do they do? And the answer is they have no goddamn idea who or where they are because we didn't tell them. Because we, they're so flat characters that they're just stuck aimlessly wandering around being existential and in the end have to pay for the price the writer set up for them. Yeah, there's and, a great existential dread where they start to worry about what the narrator is thinking. In the movie version, you never thought you'd think Richard Dreyfus would be scary, but oh, that's... Yeah. Uh, my only one regret about that is I haven't been able to get my wife to watch the DVD because she's hearing impaired and needs help with dialogue, and there's not been a good DVD release with subtitles, ever. Uh, what I would say about that is I do like the movie a lot. It's what got me to find it out about it and everything. I think it's a decent adaptation, but I think at times it drags. Like, it does these things where it's like, let's do gags with the characters. Like, let's have Rosencrantz make a sandwich. And let's have uh, let's have them do a bunch of physicsy stuff. It's mostly Rosencrantz who they add stuff to. Mm. And I get I I can kind of understand why they put it in there because it, it's made by the guy who wrote the play. He directed it. But I think he he felt like I'm in a new medium, so I should stretch out the material. And it makes it feel it ruins the pace a little bit. It makes it feel much more more plodding and more meh than the original material, which, while it feels like, man, these guys are going nowhere, it always keeps you engaged with what they're talking about and the discussions they're having. Oh, yeah. And with this, it's like, let's stop for a second so we can do a joke. And it, uh, I think I ruined the paper a little bit. And it cut off the last line. <laughs> that is horrible. Why would you do that? <laughs> I do not know why. But yeah, Sam saw it recently. Yeah, it was good. I, I enjoyed it. Yes, love that. And then, similarly, leads me into another fic, an actual fic this time, called Panaguchi and Kunikita are dot, 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 by Mr. Critical. Right. Which is a Rosencrantz and, and Guildenstern kind of thing with two char- background-ish characters from Haruhi. Uh, Panaguchi and Kunikita, who are just the main character's best friends. And they don't do much. They have very little to do in the series. 
They're fun characters, but they have little to do. So it's a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern thing of them. It's like, what the hell do they do during normal school life? And I'm like in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, the answer is not much. <laughs> it even starts off similar, where it starts off that they're doing, uh, they're doing um, rock, paper, scissors, and the result is the same every single time. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like that for different reasons of the coin flipping, where because it's all model, you can see it from Tanaguchi's head. He's thinking like he's predicting, trying to predict how it's going to go, and he's not going to change because he's sure Kuniki is going to change what he's going to do next. I mean, how could he not? And that leads them doing the same thing again. And that's a fun little thing. It's very short. It's like five hundred plus than a thousand words, but that's a little fun. Thing. Uh, Sam, I'm pretty sure I know your answer. Is there any non-Kony stuff you have to recommend? Well, I'm just going to shock everyone, every single one of our listeners, and say no. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I just lost money. Okay, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to once again say, if you want to see a really good universe where it's not from the perspective of the main characters, go with Peter David's New Frontier. And if you ever want think that Star Trek is too talky, then a captain who beams down with a sword in his scabbard is definitely someone who has a different type of uh, dynamic as the captain. Aside from that, if you want another interesting view that sometimes takes the background characters and elevates them, the first real fan fiction that I read that got convinced me that fan fiction could be good is a Neon Genesis Evangelion fic called Nobody Dies. And in that fic, None of the characters' parents die before the story. So they're raised to be more complete, less emotionally broken people. And <laughs> it takes Neon Genesis Evangelion, which is the ultimate, I will punch you in the stomach until we run out of budget and we just have the characters in a clip show. And it turns into this <laughs> more traditional, amazing, over-the-top adventure romance anime with really good writing, when at one point manages to cross over to the actual canon universe, and the characters give this reason why you suck speech, and they're like, why are all of you such awful people? And Nobody Dies is amazing. Uh, there was one amazing fiction written, I forget what it's called, but it's about the Shocker from Spider-Man. And, and it's all about the how the Shocker becomes... Uh, a more major character, how he and his bud, the Rhino, find this plan that they have to go away, how he starts flirting with the black cat. And I forget exactly what it's called, but it's all about what is it like if you're the shocker and you have to be the main character. Aside from that, I'm going to make a request. As you can tell, I'm a Star Trek fan. And if anybody can, if anybody's written any good uh, fix with the character Mares from the animated series who was a cat girl who briefly replaced Uhura, I would love to hear it. I'd love to see what people do with that character. Okay, Nick. Um, I was just going to say, first of all, um, how much of a character, that definitely sounds interesting. And I just, the bring up Star Trek reminded me of a similar idea. There's a fic, uh, not fic, there is a webcomic that's done, complete, so you can read all of it. It's called um, uh, Mary Sue Must Die, or Enzyme, Enzyme Sue Must Die. And it takes place in the new films universe. And it's Enzyme Mary Sue gets transferred to the Enterprise, and they have to get rid of her because she's the most annoying thing ever. And they can't seem to kill her. That is so true to the concept. After all, Mary Sue first appeared in the original Star Trek. Oh, this, yeah, Mary Sue is a thing. Uh, I'm trying to find it now. Oh, I cannot find this. There's a fic I want. To, I will probably find it by the time I'm done editing this. So I can put it in the description. There is a fic where it is. I want to read. It's in my list. I can't wait to get to it. It's Sweetie Bell. It it's Sweetie Bell goes to like you know get your key mark in music and goes to this college, but it's like this shonen anime, and there's like fighting monsters and they summon weapons and shit and I'm like. This sounds like the <laughs> coolest thing. Oh, Boss of Me. Boss of Me by Quick's Story. Uh, I cool. cannot wait to read this. This looks amazing. Cantalot Music Meister Academy. It looks like it's very much based off Soul Eater, which, please, please let it be somewhat based it's off Soul cool. Eater. That would be amazing. Oh, by the way, Roy, 
Uh, yes. The story that I said is called The Shocker Legit. It's about the Shocker trying to go legit with Rhino and a few other villains. So that is the story that really That's amazing. let me thought that I could that fan fiction could be cool. Hmm. Let me just tell you right now, the Shocker is my favorite Spider-Man villain. Bar, like, easily bar not. Yeah, uh, well, oh. Quiltface was really powerful in his <laughs> first appearance. Huh. Maybe his first appearance, someone, like, tallied it up. He has a better record against Spider-Man than almost any of his villains. And yet everyone treats him as a joke. Maybe that's part of the reason. I can believe but, that. But, uh, um, what's funny is there, I'm, one of the theories I'm hoping for with the new movies is that they have to do the Shocker. Please do the huh. Shocker. Please do the Shocker, or Electro, or Vulture, or Rhino, or any of the goddamn characters you never got to. Well, you know, did you hear what was going to happen with the script that they didn't go for the next Spider-Man sequel? I didn't know about that one, but I do know that there was originally going to be just the Vulture in the Sandman Spider-Man 3. But then they were told that, Sam Raimi told, no one wants to see the Vulture, you should make a movie about Venom. Everyone wants to see Venom. Well, they were going to do the Vulture, and Felicia Hardy was going to turn into the Vulture. I... Kill me. Well, you'll never have to see it. Thank you. It's almost as bad as... Did you know uh, there was a script uh, written by Frank Miller for a Superman movie in the 90s? And it involved an area where Superman flies overhead, and Superman goes, It's a bird! It's a plane! And then a character who is a, a black guy stereotype with an afro, specifies with an afro, goes, it super flies! <laughs> uh. Thank you, Frank oh, Miller. Oh, wow. Thank you. That, that movie never got made. Oh. Uh. Uh, wow. wow. So, I think that pretty much wraps up this very rambly but awesome show. Palio, you have been a great guest. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Here. I love doing this kind of stuff. All righty. Sam? Yep. Uh, so with the episode? All right. Yes. So, I would say that the uh, only thing left to say is, oh, actually, oh, gosh, I almost forgot about something. Let's not close the show yet. Oh, we'll appear. I realize there's something I wanted to get to last episode. Some people have been bugging me about this. Uh-oh. So I wanted to address <laughs> this. Some people have gone, boy, we found out that you don't like Pony POV. Why are you be hating, yo? I'll tell you why I'm hating. Uh-oh. First of all, I'm not saying I hate the entire series. I haven't read the entire series. I've read the Pony Psychology series, which for those of you who don't know, that's the beginning. For those of you who don't know, this is a series, it's a from the perspective, first person of the main six, as they're being discordized in uh, The Return of Harmony 2 Parter. Now, first of all, that's an amazing idea. And at first, it's fantastic. The way that the, it, you know, playing off when we saw on the show, that it's only partially mind control. It's more hinting and then forcing the idea further and further. And that's really well done. And I was really liking how it's good. And, dude, when it gets to Fluttershy and how it's just more of a mind rape, it is really good. <laughs> like, that was a great time. But then it gets to Rainbow Dash. And it tells us that actually Rainbow Dash wasn't discordized at all. That she made that choice on her own. And she's just going to tell her friends and hope they believe that she was discord, you know, turned discorded. And that they'll accept that she actually made that decision on her own. Which, I'm sorry, BULLSHIT! <laughs> she turned gray, damn it! You cannot pull that kind of bullshit on. When before that, the thick series had been like, oh yeah, this is supposed to be what happened in canon. Mm. Sorry if I was a little mad, but you can't complain about that kind of shit to me and not get me angry, okay? No, no, <laughs> I, I understand the way that the fix by... That in that series tended to start jumping the shark. If I remember correctly from the Pony Psychology series, it was really, really good. And then they started to talk about how the elements of harmony were doing all these bizarre, weird, long-term effects to the ponies. And it got into this weird, bizarre area there. <laughs> yeah. Which, speaking of which, uh, oddly enough, tangentially, is in my list, I'm going to get to it eventually. Uh, there's a series called Powers of Harmony that I'm interested in, which apparently is also in a universe where after some time, the elements actually start giving superpowers to the main six, and they each develop a different kind of power. And there's like a huge adventure based off that. I'm like, that sounds interesting. I would like that. And I'm like, if you're going to do that, obviously Pinkie Pie gets teleportation or something like it, <laughs> because, geez, I'd be scared. She'd be really good with stretching powers. She'd be Plastic Mare. Oh. I was going to say uh, Miss Fantastic, but okay, that works. 
Wait, wait, what about the elongated man? This is true, but old Jack the <laughs> Plastic Man was so goofy. Did you ever see the one episode pilot that was made, I think, by the no. same people that did, um, it, I think it was SpongeBob. There was a one episode uh, cartoon which was amazing, just hilarious. I've heard of that. Go on YouTube. I should actually should watch it one of these days. Yes. I, I'm sure it would be amazing. I'm not a huge fan of Plastic Man, but I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of uh, Elongated Man either. The most anyone is like, he's like Plastic Man. But he's a detective, and his wife had a horrible, horrible thing happen where she got raped by, uh, what's, uh, by, uh, Dr. Light. Dr. Light. Oh, well, Plastic Man at his best is, is the mask with stretching powers in all the best ways. You know, doing really goofy stuff, but still being a, uh, FBI agent who has to go fight crime, but when he does it, he has fun with it. Yeah. Okay, do so, after all these off, odd rambles, uh, if you would like to send us any messages or you'd like to email us, either of which will probably be read on the show, uh, you can message us over our Facebook at the Bernie Book Club. I'll have a link in the description. And even if you don't want to message us, you should totally like that Facebook page. Good idea. Because it's awesome. And it'll yeah. make you cool. More friends will like you. So, that, and then if you'd like to email us, there's the Bernie Book Club at yahoo.com. Now, talk about next week's show. The thing is, we're not... Next week would be our 20th episode, but we're not doing a show next week. There's going to be a two-week gap for our next episode. Next week, we'll be revealing what we're doing for the 20th episode, and we hope that you guys will really enjoy it. Um, we're really, really excited to it. I can't believe we've lasted this long. Uh, it's been a fun ride. Quite. So, Sam? Yes? How do you feel about this episode? Do you think it was good? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think it was good. I, Allie, I don't have thank you again for... Talia, thank you uh, for being on. Oh, thank so, you guys for the um, amazing conversation. Oh, no problem at all. It was fun. So, we'll see everyone in two weeks, um, depending on what's going on next week. I don't know if I'm going to be the one narrating the video thing of what we're doing, or I'm going to find someone awesome like Volgan to do it, if I can get him. Oh. I was going to get uh, Yaplap, but Yaplap didn't message me back, so oh. I'll have to make All righty then. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Good night, everybody. Human beings fascinate me, being just the way they are. Tell me, little pony, can you push a cart or drive a car? Liar is my instrument, but humans strum their sweet guitar. It's a mystery. Anthropology, fingers, toes, and tiny noses, brownish hair, and tannish skin. Would it be too much to ask to see the world they're living in? Everybody tells me that it's old and fake mythology. It's a mystery. Anthropology, aren't you bored of brushing your coat? Styling your mane with your hooves? I don't mean to butt in or gloat, but ancient history proves. Humans don't have wings or magic, they don't need it, they don't care, all they've got's imagination, new inventions everywhere, babies, children, teens and elders, all alike have clothes to wear, it's so real to me. Anthropology, Albert Einstein, Cleopatra, William Shakespeare, Elton John, Michael Phelps, Barack Obama, who's to say that they're all gone? Maybe humans like us too, and dress like us at Comic Con. So real to me. Anthropology. Yeah, they've had a couple of fights. Nobody's perfect, you see. Still, I say I'm born with the rights to study whatever I please. I don't need to horse around now. I can.